Mm. That's a good question. I would say, oh, they all wear the same glasses and <laughs> uh, they all have the same ma manners and just, of gesticulation. Um, that they're kind of they're kind of like introverted. I see a lot of people walking around, kind of like not sure if they should talk to someone or not. Um, I don't know. I I feel like there's a <laughs> the, the the first impression would be something about uh, people's kind of habits and mannerisms. Um, but once you get beyond that and then into a conversation, you can start to see that everyone is kind of bound by this uh, this thread of digital media that connects all of us, um, and we're all. Uh, we're all really deeply engaged with each other uh, when we're not in Minneapolis using social media, using the internet. Um, and, uh, I Sometimes I say that I work with code as a tool and as a theme, um, which to me means sometimes I'm trying to accomplish something else with the code. Like I'm trying to get pictures of people using like cameras in an automated way. Um, and in that case, it's just a, a tool to accomplish this, this, this goal. But um, sometimes I'm using code uh, as a theme in my work where I'm exploring the, um, you know, what it means to, to, for a computer to generate its own code or what it means for um, you to share code with other people, like how that performance is related to computation, but how it's related to society, how it's related to our relationships with each other. And um, so, you know, Code as a theme could mean talking about open source. It could be mean talking about computability and generative art. Um, uh, and then you have people like Marius who are doing generative art not because they're interested in code, but because they're interested in forms. So that's back to the other side. That's code as a tool, I think. Uh, a workshop, you know, when you have a face tracker, it's running this little box across your face and trying to get this idea of, you know, whether something is more face-like or less face-like in the image. And then it goes through this decision tree, trying to figure out, you know, is uh, is this little part of the face, uh, or sorry, is this little part of the image something like a face? Um, yeah, it's kind of like a face. Well, how about this part? No, it's not really like a face. Well, let's just double check. Maybe this part. Yeah, I guess that's kind of like a face. And it does this thing, you know, going down this decision tree until it gets to the end of the decision tree and it says, finally, you know what? I've looked at all these things and it's not a face. Or it says vice versa, you know, ah, I found a face finally. Um, and it does this for all the different pixels in the image um, at different scales and different positions. And uh, finally, you have, uh, you're left with a rectangle and it tells you, you know, I found a face, it's right here. And sometimes it finds multiple rectangles in the same area and it will kind of combine them for you. Um, uh, but recently there's been people who have been making um, uh, m kind of more advanced face trackers, things that don't just um, find like a rectangle, but they start to find feature points and they kind of have a an initial idea of where your face might be within that rectangle. And then it kind of snaps points to your face uh, along different edges um, uh, based on just the brightness values in the image. Um, so I've been working with those algorithms a lot um, to uh, make installations and uh, explorations and interfaces that are um, maybe more human in some ways. I guess when a, when a camera is, is looking at you, like right now, when this camera is looking at me, um, it doesn't really know that I'm a human. I could be this, I could be a television for all it cares with a per picture of a person on it. Um, well, except for the depth part. Yeah, I guess this part doesn't really w exist with television. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but normally cameras don't care about whether you're human. You can be anything, and that's kind of why they're useful, right? You can point them at anything and get a picture of it. Um, but uh, when you have, uh, when you throw a computer into the mix, then you can start letting it guess things about what's in front of the camera. Um, and when you tell it, oh, maybe there's a person in this scene, then uh, it can try and find the person and track them. Um, and uh, then as someone who's programming that computer, you can tell the computer, I want to do these things with this person. And you can kind of use the computer to mediate your relationship, uh, the relationship between you as an artist and this person who's in the space that you're uh, interacting with. Um, these algorithms, I think algorithms like face tracking or computer vision algorithms are really interesting to me because it takes a camera from being something that's passive, that doesn't know anything about the world, to something that can really mediate the relationship between an artist and someone who's interfacing with a camera. Um, 
you never see the algorithms running. The algorithms running is happening inside the CPU, inside the GPU. It's happening, you know, there's a lot of electrons flowing around and gates switching. Um, that's the algorithm running. Uh, what you see is what the person who designed the algorithm wanted to know about what was happening inside the computer. Um, so what, what you see when you see one of these algorithms running is a debug screen. Um, and it's not actually the algorithm running. It's something that someone wanted to know about what was happening internally. Um, I uh, think that there is definitely a kind of aesthetic uh, direction that culture is taking that is influenced by computation. Um, uh, I don't know if I would call it a movement uh, because that implies some sense of uh, intentionality. Um, but I would say that we are now appropriating the aesthetics of debug screens, of presets, of defaults uh, way more than we ever were before. Um, uh, the, my, my favorite example of the new aesthetic is uh, in 1974, Michael Jackson danced the robot on, uh, on TV for the first time. Um, and he wasn't dancing the robot because he wanted to understand computers better. He was dancing the robot because it looks awesome. <laughs> um, so the new aesthetic is, it's, it's people appreciating these new things that they're seeing around them um, just for the way they look. You know, maybe they're designed functionally, like they're not designed to look good. Uh, when you see a debug screen, it's not, someone doesn't design it to look really good. They make a debug screen so that they can get the most information out of it. It's very functional. But when you look at that as an outside observer, sometimes it can look awesome. You know, the motion of a planned, like, robot movement looks awesome because it has this kind of, uh, it has this uncanny quality. It has this, um, it, it looks like it has an intentionality that's kind of channeled through from the spirit of the person who designed the algorithm and then filtered through the computer that's running that. Uh, and that's really, um, I don't know, it, it draws you in and you want, to, you want to mirror that, you want to imitate that, you want to wear it on your body, you want to dance it, you know, all these things. So I feel like that's what the new aesthetic is. Uh, it's people kind of imitating and appreciating these things that are increasingly becoming cultural artifacts that are meant primarily as utilitarian things. And did, did this work? I mean, I, I write a lot of code. Um, I make my own debug screens. I, I fetishize, you know, uh, like a default preset aesthetics. So um, that shows up in a lot of what I do. But uh, um, I have my own feeling about what that means. And through the new aesthetic discussion, I've seen a lot of how other people feel about what that means and yeah, what it looks like to them when they see it. Cool. Yeah. I don't know. That one, one of the themes that will keep coming up is the fact that like, I put a lot of my stuff out there even before it's done. And even when I think it's done, other people take it in a completely other direction, a uh, completely different direction. Um, and through that process, I'm always kind of challenged to rethink myself, rethink my artwork, um, and figure out who I can be next. Because I've kind of put my cards on the table at that point, and anyone can be me in a way. Um, so, um, so I have to continually reinvent myself and figure out who I am and what I actually can contribute to other people. Um, so where he said, you know, what would it be like if we posted all of our private information online? Um, not the control of the information, but just the information. Um, so maybe you would have all of your bank records online, but not the password for accessing your bank account. Um, you know, how would that change the way that you interact with other people? How would that change how people see, um, you know, see who you are? Uh, yeah, would it would it would it make you act differently? Would it make you act better? I don't know. Maybe it would make. Nine key tweeter. I started this project where, um, for a year, I just posted everything I typed on my keyboard directly to Twitter. Um, every 140 characters just got streamed to Twitter. So I would write, 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 write. 140 characters. It would get posted, and. Um, uh, and I had a lot of friends who would go and check every now and then, say, oh, well, I wonder what Kyle's up to. Oh, and you'd see lots of little pieces of code, you know, int x equals, uh, and then interspersed with, like, communication with, my, like, uh, I don't know, writing emails, like, yeah, could you please send me a check in the amount of, <laughs> and um, <laughs> talking, talking with my girlfriend, like, you know, sweet dreams, like, have a great night, I'll see you tomorrow, um, and uh, all these things interspersed with each other, and... Uh, um, I guess the first time, you know, it, you're, you can't really, I thought, 
when I started that project, I thought, you know, oh, as long as I just, you know, keep my passwords out of this, then uh, there's no way for me to get in trouble. Like, this is not, this is not an issue. Like, this is my information I'm putting out there. But I realized really quickly that actually every conversation I had with everyone was owned by both of us. And then it wasn't my uh, words that I was giving away. It was actually both of our words. Even though I was speaking them, we both owned them. Um, and people started to get uncomfortable. And I had to start putting up like warnings on Skype. I would say, you know, I'm tweeting, I tweet what I type. On my, at the end of my emails, it would say, I tweet what I type. Um, there were points where my girlfriend was like, Kyle, like we need to talk about something and you have to turn off key tweeter. <laughs> um, so uh, it, that, that was the first time I started to get in trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, as, um, I found that when you're, ac when, you're, when you're exploring this boundary between kind of what's socially acceptable and what's kind of philosophically interesting, you can find really unusual cracks in the way that we do things. Um, uh, I started to discover that I, I did act differently. I did, I typed differently. I said different things to different people. Um, I found myself once in a, in a lecture at, at my school when I was going to school at the time. I found myself in a lecture talking to a friend over Skype about how bad the lecture was. And I realized, wait a second, like the, the guy who's lecturing right now probably knows that I'm doing this project. Why am I saying this, you know? And, and I said, you know, then I typed to my friend, you know, I shouldn't, I really shouldn't say this. Like if I have something bad to say, I'm just going to talk to him directly. And, uh, and that started changing my life actually. Like since then I've ma made a habit of going up to people and saying like, if I think, if I think something's wrong with what they're doing, like I'll have, try to have a genuine discussion with them. Um, text. So I wrote a little app that just watched me watching my computer um, every minute. It would take one photo and I did this for a few days just to see what it looked like. Um, to see anymore. Um, when I saw these images that came out, uh, I just saw this blank expression on my face for two days, basically. You know, me sitting in front of a computer for two days and blank expression. Um, and that really made an impression on me because it didn't have the life of what I found when I was typing um, on KeyTweeter. Uh, and it kind of scared me and I thought like this is something that everyone does actually I think everyone does this like looking around all my friends using their computers there They have the same expression blank expression on their face So I wanted to go out and expression uh, and the first place that came to mind was uh, the Apple store in New York City, which is a public store it's not quite a public space it's privately owned but it's publicly accessible which in the US it means that you can take photos in there um, without people's permission um, <laughs> and uh, um, fortunately uh, it was kind of within legal reason so I decided it might make people uncomfortable but I felt like there was something important there that we could all learn from this photo series so I decided to take the risk, go in there, um, install an app on all of the computers that took people's pictures the same way it took my picture, took other people's pictures every minute. Uh, if, it saw, if it saw a face, it sent the photo back to my server. Um, and, uh, and I compiled these photos and started curating them and posting them to Tumblr um, and posted a video to kind of show people that I'd been working on this project. And uh, two days later, the Secret Service woke me up at 8 a.m. They knocked on the door and uh, they said, we have a search warrant. Uh, do you know why we're here? <laughs> Which is kind of like when a cop pulls you over and asks you if you, if they know, if you know why they pulled you over. It's like, uh, it's, I don't know if there's a right way to answer that question. So um, they, they, they were really nice. They took my computers and um, uh, three months later I got them back um, and the investigation was dropped after they realized I'm just an artist and not a like credit card hacker person um, and <laughs> hackers is a really complicated word uh, it's originally it meant something that was much more like you know being ready to tweak the thing that you owned um, being able to modify the thing that you owned uh, or the thing that you were working on um, it eventually people started using it to talk about uh, individuals who uh, were kind of virtual thieves kind of breaking into remote locations that they weren't supposed to have access to um, and uh, now it's starting to be taken back again by the people who are, you know, uh, just again modifying the things that they own, building things from scratch. Um, like, and, uh, one of the problems is it's still represented in the media at, 
as having this kind of negative connotation um, and being primarily about people who are uh, maybe thieves or miscreants in some way. And um, a good example is Anonymous. Anonymous is often called like an international group of hackers. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, I, I'm, I guess they're hackers. Like they're, they're reverse engineering a lot of interesting things and they're kind of breaking into systems that they're not supposed to be breaking into, um, but also systems that they probably don't really own or have access to legitimately. Um, uh, one of the differences between what people like I do or maybe someone like Julian Oliver does is uh, the motivation for that hack. Um, the Julian has a kind of a motivation of uh, sort of putting culture in front of a mirror um, and asking people to kind of look at what they're uh, what what they're engaged with. Um, he said yesterday, you know, it's. When you got an iPod for the first time, you're like, oh, great, uh, like this can do anything I want and it only has a few buttons. Um, but it's a little different than having a Walkman where you have all these tapes and you have these things that you can see the tape moving and um, there's a kind of distance between you and the device that you own when you have an iPad. Uh, it's similar in a way. It's kind of this thing that's out there. Sometimes we talk about it as the cloud. Um, it's uh, kind of floating above us uh, and we don't really understand popularly, like in our collective unconscious, we don't understand what's going on, but we're becoming increasingly reliant upon it. Um, so someone like Julian is ready to criticize the fact that we don't understand this thing that we're carrying around in our pocket in a way. Um, the, the thing that they're criticizing is not necessarily our relationship to the technology. The thing that they're criticizing is uh, normally governments um, and transparency of uh, people in power. Um, so maybe there is some kind of, like for, for Julian Oliver, maybe there is some kind of, uh, you know, maybe there's some power to the internet that we're uh, kind of letting it have just, be, just by not understanding it. But um, for Anonymous, uh, there is a power that you know, supersedes anything that has to do with the internet, which is about governments and it's about people that are running large corporations. Um, and those are the people that they want to criticize. So, um, so some of the tools that I make uh, are trying to put uh, algorithms that are accessible by uh, governments and academia um, back into the hands of the people that they're kind of being forced on. Uh, so, uh, so face tracking kind of historically was developed uh, probably, well, it was, it was developed by um, military funding in the U.S. Um, in the 50s. Um, it's still unclear who exactly was funding it because it's classified. Um, but it was probably the CIA. And, uh, <laughs> and it's been in use ever since for doing things like, you know, recognizing criminals and tracking people in uh, large spaces. Um, automatically, um, and <laughs> you know, there's there's a certain power that these algorithms have when they're kept out of our hands. There's a power that has to do with, um, uh, you know, when when only a few people have the ability to track everyone else, then there's a chance for things to go wrong. There's the chance for things for this algorithm to be misused. Um, but and uh, so what I'd like to see is. If, if we can take these algorithms and put them back in the hands of the people that they're being forced upon, uh, maybe we can reimagine uh, like a better or different, just a future that we want. Um, um, there's a lot out there that people aren't aware of. There's a lot out there that I'm not aware of uh, that is de being developed like right now in academic institutions around the world and military research and uh, private corporate, corporate research all around the world um, to do like new and crazy stuff with computers and cameras. Um, and so one of, one of my mm, one of my favorite examples of this is the iWriter project, which uh, is an eye tracking system that was developed by some people who are not engineers <laughs> um, to help a friend who's a graffiti artist who has ALS, so that he can draw his graffiti again from his from his bed, but with his eyes. Um, so uh, structured light is basically a system where you have a camera and a projector. Uh, the projector is projecting light onto the scene and kind of 
creating uh, creating patterns where there might not have been patterns before. So example, my shirt's pretty much, uh, you know, just kind of evenly red. There's maybe some dimples in it, but uh, it would be hard for a camera to see them. So if I project a bunch of uh, noise on my shirt, or if I project like a grid or anything like that, then a camera will be able to make out the details and kind of the shape of my shirt just from the way that deforms on, on, on me. Um, and uh, the Kinect now is basically doing the same thing. The Kinect has a projector and a camera. It's an infrared projector and an infrared camera, um, which means that you can't see it visibly. It's only the camera that can see it. But it projects kind of a noisy grid pattern um, onto the scene. Um, so that even if you have something that's uh, you know, like a black background or a completely red shirt, it can still make out the shape of it. Um, um, and then when the Kinect came out, people started playing again with point clouds because it's the easiest way to represent 3D data from these devices. Um, uh, there was one video that kind of blew everyone's mind where uh, it was a virtual, virtual reality researcher who was just showing, you know, here's the view from the Kinect and talking about how the Kinect works. And then all of a sudden, at some point, he takes the virtual camera and he goes, and he rotates it to look from another perspective. And it's like halfway in the video. And I think at that point, everyone's minds just exploded. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and he's using points to render, this, to render this scene. And now you guys are putting me in this virtual space where I'm, I'm made up of points maybe, or a mesh, or maybe I'm in, I have depth of field, or maybe I have, uh, I don't know, something else. There's some crazy background behind me. I don't know. Um, now you guys have to do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I exist in a similar space, but um, uh, we don't really know where it's going. We don't know uh, what, what the use of this is. I mean, it's kind of an interesting aesthetic. It's, it can tell an interesting story, but we're not sure what's going to happen with this next. In 10 years, what are we going to be using 3D cameras for? Um, in a way, it's been answered. Like there, There's an answer already, actually. There's an answer that comes from Hollywood, which is that 3D cameras are useful for remapping people's faces and like creating lots of copies of someone like if you look at the matrix you know they're creating lots of copies of people or if you look at um, any CG movie in like the last five years they're you know doing some kind of remapping of an actor's face onto a virtual character um, there's an answer like that's the answer from Hollywood which is that 3d cameras are useful for uh, like putting actors in spaces they can't be in or making lots of copies of actors or retargeting animations from one face to another um, but the fact that we've kind of become so enamored with these point clouds and these messages and that we really like the way that they look, um, it's kind of like the culture fighting back a little bit, like popular culture fighting back and saying, you know, hey, Hollywood, like maybe that's not what they're good for. Maybe there's something else we can use these things for. Um, and maybe we can figure out what that is. I don't know what it is right now, but uh, we're going to figure it out. <laughs> um, um, and uh, sometimes there's people like Marius Watts who take the MakerBot and they make something really beautiful that no one could have imagined before, um, takes it off the screen, makes a physical version of it, and it means something completely different in the real world to be able to touch it and see it from different angles. Um, and you know what? I think with Marius's work, it's not just novelty. Like I think there's something he's got to there that is like a different kind of beauty that couldn't have existed before, and it's not going to fade in like five or ten years. People people aren't going to work, look back and say, you know, oh yeah, Marius's stuff was cool for the time. They're going to look back and say, oh yeah, I wish I could have one of those still today. Um, and the Connect was meant for. The Connect was meant to be a skeleton tracker and a gesture recognizer, so that people could interface with their games. Um, and that's kind of the message that's been given to us. The Connect is for playing games using gestures. Um, but I had uh, I have a good friend, uh, Greg Bornstein, who has used that skeleton tracker to watch people who are trying to sit still but have certain neuromuscular diseases that make it really difficult for them to sit still. Um, so he watches them with the Connect, or they watch themselves really, and analyze that uh, over time. Normally, these people. Uh, which is this thing that previously had required hundreds of thousands of dollars in doctor's visits, um, but now for like a hundred bucks, they have this thing sitting in their home that's uh, replacing all that, uh, and that's not novelty. <laughs> that's uh, is that the uh, the programmer is trying to uh, accomplish something specific and solve a problem. Uh, sorry, the programmer is trying to solve a problem. Uh, they're both trying to accomplish something. I mean, it's not like an artist sits down and doesn't want to accomplish something. Um, it's that the programmer is trying to solve a problem and the artist isn't necessarily trying to solve a problem. Um, they're 
normally trying to do something that they would call exploring things or something like inventing or creating uh, like alternative realities or um, it's this kind of exploration versus problem solving distinction that I think uh, is, is a good um, way of describing the difference between programmers and artists who work with code. Um, um, one of the big differences between uh, uh, programmers and artists who work with code is um, uh, that when a programmer uh, has kind of solved their problem, like it's really obvious. Um, and when an artist has kind of explored things sufficiently, it's not really obvious. Um, there's a point where you kind of have to convince yourself like, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was going for. Um, <laughs> as I can show this, it's kind of this ongoing conversation with other, other artists instead of just something that's, you know, you put out there once when you're done because you're never really done. I mean, the programmer is done. The programmer has a problem that they solve and then they solve it. Um, but an artist isn't ever really done. It's they're part of a much bigger discussion. Um, yeah, and I know like if you really wanted to, like you could turn this into a camera and like you could follow it around and this could be, you know, looking at me right now. I don't know if you really, if you really wanted to, but. <laughs> uh, the reason that discussion is important is that you can ask a bunch of people these questions and we're gonna give you answers about like why, why we think this stuff is important and where we think it's going, but as many people as you can interview, that does not compare to everyone online who has some opinion about this that can maybe contribute like, actually, maybe there's this one person like 100 comments down who has the answer. <laughs> you know, it sounds ridiculous, but maybe if you just scroll down far enough, there's this, it's kind of like a Borges story. It's like hidden deep within this comment thread. There's the one person who has the answer to your question. And it's like, really, they know where it's going next. Uh, and I, a workshop, you know, when you have a face tracker, it's running this little box across your face and trying to get this idea of, you know, whether something is more face-like or less face-like in the image. And then it goes through this decision tree trying to figure out, you know, is, uh, is this little part of the face, uh, or sorry, is this little part of the image something like a face? Um, yeah, it's kind of like a face. Well, how about this part? No, it's not really like a face. Well, let's just double check. Maybe this part. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a face. And it does this thing, you know, going down this decision tree until it gets to the end of the decision tree and it says, finally, you know what? I've looked at all these things and it's not a face. Or it says vice versa, you know, ah, I found a face finally. Um, and it does fit. Um, but uh, when, you have, uh, when you throw a computer into the mix, then you can start letting it guess things about what's in front of the camera. Um, and when you tell it, oh, maybe there's a person in this scene, then uh, it can try and find the person and track them. Um, and uh, then as someone who's programming that computer, you can tell the computer, I wanna do these things with this person. And you can kind of use the computer to mediate your relationship uh, the relationship between you as an artist and this person who's in the space that you're uh, interacting with. Um, sometimes that can mean taking pictures of them. Sometimes that can mean uh, taking pictures of the person who's, who's in the space. Sometimes that can mean, um, you know, watching all of the nuances of the person's face and amplifying them in some way. Um, maybe using them to trigger sounds or maybe showing them an image of themselves again, but with uh, someone else's face on top of their own. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the uncanniness of computer vision algorithms comes from a few different places. It's that uh, fact that um, you know having it be completely human would not be helpful. Having it be completely machine would not be helpful. So there's this kind of intermediary place that the debug screens inhabit. And I think it has to do a lot with um, people kind of designing debug screens for themselves. Um, so you're kind of seeing uh, you're, when, when you look at a debug screen, when you look at an algorithm running, you're seeing the, um, the sort of spirit of the person who designed that. Mm. And so the, Julian has a kind of a motivation of uh, sort of putting culture in front of a mirror um, and asking people to kind of look at what they're, uh, what, what they're engaged with. Um, he said yesterday, um, the internet is a uh, collection of poorly understood technologies that we are increasingly reliant upon. Um, um, I mean, I think it's important to talk about like understanding your devices and your environment better. And it's also important to talk about like, you know, what, uh, what things are going on behind the scenes uh, with power relations that we might not be aware of. Um, but in a way, they're very different because they have uh, these different motivations. That was really nice. Um, 
one of the things that I th think is really important is to take that stuff uh, and grab it as soon as possible. I want to grab these algorithms that are in development and kind of show them to people as soon as I can so that they can have a glimpse and like be prepared uh, for like what's what's coming. Not, not just because they need to like protect themselves or something, but because they should start imagining like how do I want this to be part of my life? You know, you can, you can shape something uh, a lot more. You, you have a lot more control over something if you can grab it at, when it's getting started, right? So one of, one of, uh, at some point, I expect that eye tracking will be embedded in pretty much all of the cameras um, that are around us. Uh, but, uh, but we're in this interesting intermediate point right now in time where, uh, you know, the technology exists, but it's not everywhere yet. Which means that we can kind of craft the we can we can shape the direction that we want it to go. Um, so when you have to render this scene, and now you guys are putting me in this virtual space where I'm I'm made up of points maybe or a mesh or maybe I'm in I have depth of field or maybe I have uh, I don't know something else or some crazy background behind me I don't know. Um, now you guys have to do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I exist in a similar space, but um, uh, we don't really know where it's going. We don't know uh, what, what the use of this is. I mean, it's kind of an interesting aesthetic. It's, it can tell an interesting story, but we're not sure what's going to happen with this next. In 10 years, what are we going to be using 3D cameras for? Um, and